Thank you very much. Thank you. Gene, thank you very, very much. Uh, do appreciate that short introduction. Um, and first of all, let me say uh, how intimidating it is to follow a preacher, <laughs> especially one who did such an excellent job of preaching. So thank you. Um, and let me also say thank you to all of you for being here, for the work that you do every single day on behalf of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Americans uh, who need advocates, who need folks who are willing to stand up. My staff, I think, knows that one of my uh, favorite Bible stories and a story that I often talk about out of my own faith uh, tradition uh, is the story of the loaves and fishes. And you all, I'm sure, are familiar with it. Uh, the notion that uh, Jesus is speaking to the multitudes and recognizes that the time of the day is late. Uh, folks are obviously hungry. Uh, he instructs his disciples to go feed the people. They initially say, how can we possibly do that? Um, he says, have faith, pass the baskets. They start with a handful of loaves and a few fish. When it's all said and done, thousands were fed. And when they collected the baskets back, they actually had more than when they started with. Um, I was in a Catholic church one day when a priest explained that the power of that story is oftentimes the power of, of God and the miracle uh, that was worked. But he suggested that an equally ex explanation that is as powerful is that it was the sense of community, the power of community, the miracle of community, that really is the underlying aspect of that story. And I think about that in the context of the discussion we're having today about nutrition, about access to food, and good food, and quality food, and healthy food. That it is, in fact, the power of community that can make that happen. Uh, and part of that community is the faith-based community, which you all represent. But an equally important part of that community is government. Sometimes we have a tendency to sort of separate the notion of government from some other aspect of, of life and, and some other aspect of community, but it is an integral part of community. The notion that we pull our resources and then reallocate them to where the need is. And I want to tell you that I'm proud to be part of this administration because the president was quite clear when he asked me to take this job again. He said his expectation was that we would do what we could to strengthen community, to strengthen the, the connection between community and the most vulnerable in our country, to make sure that people were well fed, that it wasn't just about nutrition, uh, or it wasn't just about food security, it was also about nutrition security, that it was both, that you needed to make sure that programs had meaningful benefits. You needed at the Department of Agriculture to work to make sure that folks had access to affordable, healthy foods. That the department would do a better job of translating the, the science of nutrition so that ordinary folks could understand how to make the best choices for themselves and their families. And that most importantly of all, strengthening and leveraging the power of government with the power of the other aspects of community, including the faith-based community. And that's what brings me here today. Because we've taken steps over the last two years to do what the president instructed us to do. In terms of meaningful benefits, one of the first things we did was to take a look at the SNAP program and ask the fundamental question, what is the underlying calculation that goes into determining the level of benefits? And has it been adjusted for the real world experience of families who struggle financially. Well, it turns out it hadn't been done for 45 years. Turns out that it actually did make a difference when you considered the physical activity of a family of four, when you looked at what families were in fact purchasing at a grocery store, not some hypothetical, that you actually looked at the cost of what it actually would take 
to make sure that a family had access to food. And so it turned out that we had to increase the basic benefit by a pretty significant amount. But when you think about it, if you don't do it every 45 years, it's going to be a significant increase. <laughs> but there are some who felt that that wasn't the right thing to do, felt that uh, we, we didn't have authority to do it. Well, of course we had authority. We had legal authority. We also had moral authority to do it. And so the SNAP program was, was, was strengthened. But it wasn't just the SNAP program. It was the women and infant children program as well. I mean, the reality is if we want youngsters to make the right choices, if we want them to have access to healthy food, we've got to get them early. And that's what the WIC program does. It, it creates an opportunity for families who need just a little bit of extra help and a little bit of assistance to put that package together. And so we looked at the package, we improved the package, we created uh, an incentive for fruits and vegetables, a bonus, if you will, for more uh, opportunity for families to, to purchase fruits and vegetables. And when we recognized that indeed about 50% of those who were eligible for this program weren't participating or were leaving the program early. And so we took resources from the American Rescue Plan and began a process of, of, of figuring out, well, how could we reach that other 50%? How could we engage the community to understand the significance of this program? And, and how could we ensure that we would be able to continue uh, that bonus payment, continue to have access to fruits and vegetables for these young people. And it wasn't just, it wasn't just the WIC program, it was also the summer feeding program. The reality is that we do a pretty good job for 181 days out of the year when kids are in school, but then they leave for summer vacation. And we have a summer feeding program, but during the pandemic we learned that maybe there's a way in which we can expand on that. Maybe there was a way in which we could provide just a little bit of additional help. Maybe we could give that family of a free and reduced lunch kid uh, a card that would allow them to redeem a, a few more nutritious items at the grocery store during the course of the summer months. It was extraordinarily successful. We saw, we saw a significant uh, uptake. We saw healthier results. We saw a reduction in poverty. And so we made the commitment starting next year, to have a permanent summer feeding program. But that's 2024. I checked the calendar, we're in 2023. So what about 2023? So we said to states, well, we'll continue what we did sort of during the pandemic. Now, we had to call it the pandemic EBT because that's what it was called. Do you know that there are a handful of states today <laughs> that at this point in time don't appear prepared to take advantage of this program for their kids? There's about 10 of them. I mean, why would they not do this? Well, what's, what's the rationale? for not wanting to provide resources for kids during the summer months when we know that when we do, those resources will be used for nutritious food and that they will help that youngster be better prepared and healthier when they begin the school year in August and September. Why wouldn't you do that? So I asked my staff, I said, well, what's the explanation? Well, sir, we, you call it the pandemic EBT, and some people think the pandemic's over. Well, call it something else. <laughs> I mean, seriously, call it something else, but not take advantage of it. I would point out that we're also trying to make it a little bit easier this year with our traditional summer feeding program, particularly in rural areas. Uh, providing an example, providing a, 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 an opportunity for non-congregate sites to be used because we learned from the pandemic that sometimes when you do that, more people take advantage of it. I mean, the point of this is 
We have the resources, we have the programs, we have the capacity, we have the will, uh, and we have the opportunity to really make a difference in the lives of literally 30 million children. 30 million kids. So I hope would be that those states basically understand the importance to their future, to their children's future, to participate. I would hope that governors would be supportive of expanding that WIC program and that members of Congress would see that it was an important investment. I would hope that governors would understand and appreciate the importance of the SNAP program and making sure that people who are qualified for it actually participate and use it, that we don't create a series of requirements and barriers to make it harder for people. I would hope that that would be the case in a caring community. I would hope that we'd understand the important role that the school feeding program, that we look for opportunities to expand the school breakfast program because the reality is a lot of kids come to school and they haven't had breakfast. And when they do, they learn better. And you know what? We're all beneficiaries of that. We're all beneficiaries, frankly, of all of these nutrition programs. We're all beneficiaries when people eat healthier. We have less health care costs. We're, we're beneficiaries because kids learn better and they become more productive citizens. And we're, 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 we're better off because we have a stronger democracy. Make no mistake about this, folks. Make no mistake about this. You're here today because you're, you, you, you understand the, and appreciate the moral calling of this. You understand the significance and importance of a caring community wanting and needing to do this. But I want to make the case to you today that democracy depends on this. Democracy depends on this. Democracy is, is a... <laughs> de democracy is a very fragile thing. We shouldn't think that because we've got a Declaration of Independence or we have a Constitution that somehow that, that our democracy is assured. If you think about, and I shared this with your leadership team, if you think about all of the hot spots in the world today, all the places where there's conflict, where there's difficulty, there, there is a constant, a, a, there's a constant stream that runs through all of those locations. And that is that they have many, many hungry people and many, many unemployed people. And so if you diminish the nutrition programs, if you make it harder to participate in them, and you make fewer and fewer people have access to them, then you create a larger and larger group of people who have nothing to lose. You create a larger and larger group of people who are unhappy with their circumstances. And that's a threat to democracy. I don't, I don't under, I'm not uh, overemphasizing this. I want you folks to think about this. Because you go home and you are leaders, you are people that, that others look to for what is this all about? Why is this important? Why is it necessary to have a SNAP program and to have a school feeding program and to, and, and, and to have a summer feeding program? Why is that necessary? Why do we have to spend the money for it? Because it's what creates a stability about our democracy that is important to America's growth. It's about making sure the next generation are well cared for and well fed. It's about making sure that they can learn well. It's about making sure that people have hope and, and a sense that the community cares about them. There are a multitude of reasons why all of this is important. And you all are the voice for carrying that message. You're the trusted voice for carrying that message. You're the caring voice for carrying that message. And I'm here today just basically to say we want to be partners with all of you. In our office of uh, 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 and, and USDA Center for Faith-Based uh, and Neighborhood Partnership is working today with a number of organizations in partnership to ensure that we get the word out, that we're working collaboratively, that we're leveraging our our resources together to strengthen this sense of community. So, you know, I started out life in a Catholic orphanage, and the one thing I know about myself, my early life, is that I was well fed. Now, I know that because I have pictures of when I was adopted, 
and um, it, I was well fed. <laughs> but you know, when I see those pictures of myself, I, I have no idea the people who fed me. I, I, I don't know who they were. I don't know their names. I don't know if they're still alive. I don't know why they were in that orphanage doing what they were doing. But I know that for the first several months of my life, despite the fact that I was alone, I wasn't. I had people that cared about me, people who fed me. And there's no greater connection than that. So I've grown up always understanding the significance of feeding people and caring for people and loving people. And maybe that's why I was drawn to that loaves and fishes story. And that's why I'm here today. This is a critical moment. This is a critical moment in the conversation and discussion that we're having in this country about what kind of country we are. And we do indeed require people to persevere. We do indeed need people to speak up. We do indeed need people to remind folks of the significance and importance of these programs. We, we do need to make sure that those folks who are receiving those programs understand that there are people who appreciate how hard they've worked in life, how difficult their circumstances may be, how they are not necessarily the stereotype that others try to convey, that they're good, decent, honest people who with a little bit of help can do good things and want to do good things who care deeply about their children, who simply want their kids to be fed. They'll never know who you are. They won't know your names. They won't know your religious affiliation. They won't know who you talk to. They won't know how significant you are in your community. But you can make a difference in their lives. You can ensure that every one of those people who struggles as a friend and a voice, you can be sure that they will have the benefit of community. And in doing so, you're going to remind this country of the strength of community and of unity at a time when it's needed, perhaps more now than just about any other time in certainly recent history. So I am extraordinarily humbled to be in your presence because I know how tough the work is that you're doing and I know how well you do it and how much you care. So think about those kids. Think about those working moms and dads who are struggling, part-time jobs, low-income jobs, just need a little bit of community, just need a little bit of help. You can make a difference in a life and you will and you must. Because not only do those families depend on it, so does our democracy. Thank you.